political foreign policy meetings to stave off war in Europe came to a halt on a Marseille street today, when King Alexander of Yugoslavia was assassinated by a lone gunman. The assassin was quickly sliced down by a sabre-carrying horse guard, then set upon by the angry crowd. In the pandemonium, it was an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. She said, my war was filled with love and laughter. Yes, there were deaths, yes, there were tears, but love and laughter. And she just, you know, she was a flower that bloomed in wartime. I was a Kiwi girl in a hurry. Yes, this is Nancy Wake in Marseille. A world away from home, far from New Zealand, far from Australia. This was just the beginning. Soon, I'd be a spoilt French society wife, a German-hating resistance fighter, the Nazi's most wanted woman, codenamed the White Mouse, and a hard-drinking, foul-mouthed special agent, trained to kill. Could this really be my story? If you'd told me then, I'd have said you were bloody dreaming. She made the best of the war, and the war made the best of her. I mean, they got, they got a lot from Nancy Wake. She was a, she was the real deal. So there she is, um, drop dead gorgeous, New Zealand Australian woman, learning French, working at working as a journalist. So she'd strut up and down the boulevards and go to the restaurants, and she formed great friendships with her fellow journalists, most of whom were men who looked after her. And, you know, the French have always valued, no joke, a gorgeous woman, of whom she was one. So then I ran back to my hotel and typed up the story. <laughs> right place, right time. You were born lucky, Nancy. Born to attract trouble. Same thing, isn't it? Someone that runs away from home at 16 and makes their life for themselves and teaches themselves to be a, a journalist in Europe and teaches themselves a foreign language. I think that's a pretty self-contained kind of person. Excuse me, mademoiselle. I've seen you somewhere before, I think. In Marseille, the Hôtel de Louvre. That's where I stay when I'm working. Yes. I never forget a beautiful face. <laughs> I'm Henri Fiocca. Nancy Wake. Enchanté. And you are from? New Zealand, originally. You're a long way from home, Nani. It's Nancy. And actually, I'm quite at home right here. A telephone number. <clears throat> next time you're in Marseille? I'll be there next week. So will I. Convenient. But I don't ring gentlemen, Monsieur Fiocca. Gentlemen ring me. Call it my foreign policy. Au revoir, mademoiselle. She loved Paris. She even more loved the Riviera. The first time she went was in the late 1930s, went down to Marseille, and it was like, who's been keeping this a secret? The Mediterranean, the villas, the chateaus, the beautiful people, la belle monde. And uh, she absolutely adored the whole thing. She described herself as a giddy young thing, but I don't think she was that giddy. Uh, she always struck me as the kind of woman who knew what she wanted, and she knew how to get it. Bonjour, mademoiselle. You have a visitor. Bonjour, Nancy. <laughs> Merci, Antoine. How did you know I was here? You are staying a week? <laughs> then I'm off. Vienna, Berlin. Why? You must have heard what's happening. I want to get the story firsthand, get a look at De Führer. Why you? Others can go, let them and miss the action. What possible reason would I... Maybe I should have listened to Henri. Even as a journalist, it made me feel sick to my stomach. 
I'd only just arrived and I was desperate to leave again. Everyone around me was completely mesmerized. Their eyes glazed over, their breathing seemed to stop. It fired her up. Everything she saw about Nazism just absolutely in her, it reviled her soul. She was appalled by everything she saw of it. And, you know, she made the vow, if I ever get a chance to do something, I will. At one point, she goes to Austria and she sees firsthand the way the Jews are being mistreated. And there was at one point, she, on the cobbled streets of Vienna, she saw a Jewish man who, his major crime was being Jewish, and he was being beaten by a stormtrooper. And that just absolutely made Nancy's blood boil. It was at that point she realised just how brutal the Nazis were and that she, along with others, would have to do something about it. Rich and powerful. My, she has landed on her feet. Born lucky, didn't I tell you? So, Micheline, what's with the old sarapus? Oh, Henri's father. He thinks Nancy is trouble. Tried everything to break them up as if he had a chance. Nancy adored Henri. Um, I think marrying him to an extent was a, a means to an end for her because it gave her a degree of social status and connections within polite Marseille society. They couldn't have heard that he was a very, very wealthy man. And when they, when, they, when they got married, she had a staff, a household staff of five. Five people making the dinner and, you know, cleaning the house and driving her around. And uh, from memory, she would have baths of milk, you know, that kind of thing. And would sometimes, you know, would frequently arise at 10 and say, you know, I will have my lunch on the patio. Oh, no. yeah. Yeah. Not even married in white. Made a worse match if he had tried. Look at her. Foreign. Protestant. Auguste de Such a mistake. And at what price? Hmm? Look, Nancy was a good hater. She could have hated for Australia, she could have hated for New Zealand, she could have been the Australasian champion of hating. And in those years, the person she hated most was Henri's father. And he said to Henri, beautiful women, you've got a dozen of them, why pick this one? And, <laughs> and Nancy sensed that from the very beginning. <laughs> My husband is a gentleman and a gentleman. His father, on the other hand, is an ass. <laughs> <laughs> Happy days, kid. <laughs> Yes. Look, if I can be an amateur psychologist for a moment and try and form up some idea of what formed this woman, when she was four or five years old, her father abandoned the family. She always came back to that. Her dear daddy, that she used to wait at the garden gate for daddy to come home every day, and then she'd sit in his lap and he'd read to her and she'd cuddle him and he'd cuddle her and there was all this sort of love and then bang, where's daddy? He's gone. When's he coming back? He's not and that really powerfully affected her. The invasion of France was a huge moment of incredible trauma for the French because they had been led to believe throughout the period between the wars that, the, that they would win quite easily. People suddenly realised the government had lied to us about everything. They started pouring out of Paris. No one knew what was going on. Except that the Germans were advancing rapidly. So I think for people like Nancy, it was a probably very, a very troubling moment because knowing what to do in that context, which was completely unexpected, and that um, nobody had really been prepared for. What can you do? They won't take you as a nurse if tried. Yes, but they're desperate for more ambulances and drivers. You've got trucks at the factory. Convert one for me and I'll drive it to the Belgian front. It won't cost you much. Huh. Lonnie, you eat money like no one else I know. Give me a truck. But you don't even know how to drive. I can learn. You don't have to do anything. Why are you so... determined? Because you'll be off fighting and... 
I'll be stuck here by myself with nothing to do but worry about you, miss you. Give me my ambulance. Dirty tactics, Madame Fiocca. You'd be surprised what I'd do for a good cause. Show me. She had the means to cocoon herself from the war. She did not need to get involved in the war. Uh, the Germans were not going to, that, down in that part of France initially, were not going to be occupying that part of France. She had no need. But Nancy became involved very early on. If you stay here, worse for you. Come on, come on. After Marshal Pétain, had, uh, who was the hero of the First World War, had basically sued for peace with Hitler and said, you know, we've, we've got to throw in our lot, we've got to collaborate. So much for joie de bloody vivre. I cried for a week when the armistice was signed. I wasn't fooled, and anyone else with half a brain was in floods. Our freedom, everything we stood for, had been dashed away with the stroke of a pen. There's only one man, General de Gaulle, who refuses to accept the idea of an armistice and sets himself up in London and does this extraordinary speech on the 18th of June, the day, the day after Pétain's, calling for the flame of resistance to not to go out. They called de Gaulle a defector, a general who'd run away to England. They could call him what they damn well liked. All I knew was, he was speaking my language. She became involved bit by bit with a Scot by the name of Ian Garrow, who organised, helped organise the local resistance movement. And what he, what, what he asked her to do initially, she was asked, can you take this, when you go to Cannes the next time, can you take this small package? She didn't ask what the package was, he didn't tell her, but she delivers it. And there is this nascent resistance movement just, just getting on its feet through France. And she became progressively more involved. Oh, simple. This is ridiculous. We can support the goal in other ways. I have money, transport, factories. Yes, we'll use those too, but this is my chance to do something. You already did. You drove an ambulance. Oh, yes, for five minutes, while you fought at the front line in two wars. Oh, well, mother, just not a competition. Well, no, not anymore. <sighs> Sorry, Garo, carry on. What else? Once the radio parts are hidden, it's really a matter of courage passing the German checkpoints. All right. It's not all right. You should never have been asked to do this. But I was. You can't make me say no. I'm asking you to be reasonable. And it's unreasonable to want to help liberate France. Nonny, please. I'm doing it, whether you like it or not, so you might as well shut up about it. Listen to yourself. You know, resistance is no place for rich, spoiled, temperamental women. <laughs> no. No place at all, which is exactly why they want me. If she goes out there, if you go out there with that stuff in your courts, they'll find it. You'll be dragged away. I'll never see you again. Is that what you want? That won't happen. I think for Nancy, the thrill of the chase was, was half of the fun. Um, she certainly wanted to fight the good fight, um, but also the idea of doing something under the radar, outfoxing the Nazis, that would have been part of the thrill for her. German checkpoints, don't have a barricade across the road, and there'd be swarthy German men with guns 
on their guard and they're looking for the enemy. And what is the enemy going to look like? Well, it's going to look a bit like them. It's going to be men with guns. And there's a there's a beautiful, beautiful through line going past. Where are these men? Where are these men with guns? And, and that was and Nancy always felt that her sexiness, uh, her attractiveness, was a was perhaps her greatest weapon that that she had. That she didn't look like the Germans thought an enemy should look like. She wasn't fearful of being caught, which is remarkable. So she she backed herself against you know the Gestapo or the police or anybody else that was after her. She thought she could outwit them. She thought she could talk her way out of trouble. And uh, she never stopped to think about the risks. Packages and radio parts were all links in a secret chain that smuggled prisoners and soldiers down the escape lines and out of France. We knew that every man we got home was a thorn in Hitler's side, and it felt fantastic. The escape lines really began in the north of France and in Belgium, and to a little extent in Holland, whereby quite a lot of soldiers from the British Army were left behind and needed to escape. And then, when the bombing of Germany began and some of the crews had to bail out and land in occupied Europe, then the local population, in part, was at great pains to try and get them to safety. Nancy joined an escape line, which was one of the best of all, most effective of all. It was run by a man who took the name of Pat O'Leary, who um, had set up an arrangement to smuggle people out, either across the, um, uh, the Mediterranean to Spain or over the Pyrenees into Spain. Just to meet you here, your clothes. Feel free to get in here. Uh, here is your passport. There. Now, a lot of things needed to be done. Someone had to go and collect them from a safe house and bring them to another safe house and then take them from the safe house to hand them over to someone else who would hand them over to a guide. They would have had to be very organised. They would have had to have a, had a system whereby when these airmen turned up, they had a place they put them, they had people who were coming in and the ha out of the house who knew how to deal with that, who knew when and how to talk about it. Nancy's role was really as a courier in all this, and she really was, if you like, the gopher, a very effective gopher for the Pat line. Something to remember spine. <laughs> Good luck. Good luck. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. But there were German agents all over the place, of course. Good luck, Nancy but she really wanted to be into the action and into it as fully as possible. And I have no doubt, having studied her personality from the beginning, that she was extremely active and was seeking uh, Pat O'Leary's permission to do more and more in the Pat line. She was the kind of woman who could read situations and read people, um, read people's reactions to her. She obviously knew how to play certain situations to her advantage. She had this kind of intuition. Garrow at one point brought another man to her home his name was Paul Cole. Hello, Garo. Afternoon, Madam Fioka. I hope you don't mind us calling unannounced. I'd like to introduce Mr... I don't care who that man is. He's not welcome here. I beg your pardon? You heard me. Please leave. Now. Why? What have I... I asked you to leave. Do I have to throw you out myself? Fine. I'm going. Crazy bitch. Why'd you even bring me here? And don't come back. Why the hell did you do that? You saw him sitting in Henri's chair drinking his whiskey. Who does that man think he is? He fought at Dunkirk. He risked his life to save others. I find that hard to believe. I was vetted by O'Leary, damn you. Paul Cole may not have the kind of manners that you like, but he deserves your respect and your help. You can't treat him like that. This is my home. I will treat him how I bloody well like. Not if you want to work for us. Your choice. You can sing his praises till kingdom come. I don't like Paul Cole. I don't trust him. I won't help him get out of France. I don't want anything to do with him. If Nancy didn't like you, you'd certainly know about it. She had uh, the kind of personality that would flick on and off like a light switch. 
So, I mean, if there was somebody in the house who she thought was a collaborator or an informer, um, she would have sniffed them out pretty quickly. Fought at Dunkirk, my foot. Cole was a coward, a thief and a Gestapo spy. He betrayed Garrow and 50 others, but he never even mentioned my name. To him, I was just some silly, spoilt, clueless woman. So he forgot all about me. I think the Cole episode was seminal, and I think that that confirmed in her. My instincts are good. If in doubt, back, me, back, my, own, back my own feelings on things. Late in 42, life in the Marseille resistance turned tits up. Thousands of Nazi troops stormed into the south, tightening their grip on power. And a savage new police was formed to target Jews and the resistance, the Milice. They were vicious and they were French. I hated them even more than I hated the Gestapo. If they were caught by the Germans, they would be most likely interrogated pretty brutally and then either shot or sent to a, a concentration camp where these conditions were, of course, vile. The Germans had a code name for her. They were aware that there was this woman working against them, a beautiful woman they would hear tell of, and it seemed that every time they had her cornered, she would get away, and they called her the White Mouse. But it was also clear that sooner or later they really were going to come for her because the Germans became more and more aware of her activities. Things became hotter and hotter. My instincts began humming. Then one day my friend, a cafe owner on the corner, whispered a warning. Nancy, this morning you were followed. You have to get out. Use the escape line. Go to England. What about you? If they suspect me, then... I'll be fine. I'll follow you later. When? When I'm sure the business can survive without me. <sighs> I have to think of my father. My workers, their families. These are bad times. I have a duty. You understand? Yes, of course I do. I know the man I married. I don't want to run away either. I feel like a coward. No, this is a tactical retreat. Any clever white mouse would do it. I still can't believe I have a code name in Berlin. A code name? A dossier? You're on the Nazis' most wanted list. It's enough, Noni. Now, take this. Your lucky five pound note, isn't that what you call it? Only lucky if I get to spend it on you. As soon as you get to London, send me word. I'll be there when I can. She was always up front with me that, you know, the love of my life was my first husband, Henri Fiocca. And so to have left him under those circumstances was a bitter blow because, she, you know, where she wanted to be, she wanted to be with Henri. She wanted to be Madame Fiocca. She said she was heartbroken. And she was also worried about what might happen uh, uh, if she disappeared. But at the same time, if both she and Henri left at the same time, then that would have been instantly suspicious. Enjoy your shopping. Bonjour. Bonjour. Buy something I like. Don't I always? Henri, I know you won't be faithful to me while I'm away, and nothing I can say will make you faithful. Henri. But I want you to know I will never ask. You have to promise me that you won't ask me either. Why are you saying this to me now? Are you trying to make me jealous? No. It's because it's wartime and... I don't know what's going to happen. I love you. Bye, my darling. See you soon. Bonjour. It's a love story, but it's a French love story. In any other country, the lo he'd be faithful and she'd be faithful. <laughs> in a French love story. They loved each other. Uh, was he faithful? No, he's French. <laughs> okay, that's the way it is. And Nancy realised pretty early on that he was not being faithful to her. Uh, but, you know, 
as was the habit of the day, she more or less accepted it. She left Henri in a pretty bad circumstances. He volunteered to stay behind and, and cover for her. I, she knew that she'd run out of luck and had to get the hell out of there. The staggering thing is, despite having worked in this network to get all these people through across the Pyrenees, for her, getting to England was just about impossible. I caught the train west, heading for the Pyrenees. I'd already cried my way to the station, always looking over my shoulder. I wrote to Henri, pretending I was leaving him. I hoped the bloody Gestapo would read that letter too. There were mishap after mishap. There were, there were, the whole network was broken because of the testimony provided by Cole and the arrests that had been made by the Nazis, and it was not easy. Deciding to leave France was hard enough. Actually doing it was harder still. For three infuriating months, storms blocked the mountain passes. While I traipsed around Toulouse in a foul mood in my only set of clothes, but I kept getting on that train. La milice est à bord et il contrôle tout le monde. Halt, stehen bleiben. Wo wollen Sie denn denn so schnell? Her fearlessness, is, I think, divides her from the rest of us. Thinkers get scared, I think. People who, who've got to um, think too much about consequences. When the chips were down, I don't think she allowed herself that luxury. Henri used to joke that I could eat money like no one else he knew. No champagne to wash it down. The interesting thing, okay. With Nancy, at the point that she's in jail, that would be very close to the low point of her war. Because there she is, she's one of the most wanted women in Europe, she's top of the Gestapo list. When they asked why I was on the train, I said I'd had a fight with Henri and walked out. They called me a liar, said my ID was fake, that I was a prostitute from Lourdes who had set off a bomb and run away. They interrogated me for four days, but never once checked my story. I told them nothing. Mercifully, they don't know. The, the authorities don't realise that the woman they've got in cell B uh, is, the, is the white mouse, and because she's not, she's not telling them who she is, and she's not, she's not cooperating at all. But her fear was, they'll work it out. Next thing I'll know, it'll be a firing squad and I'll be, I'll be gone. One day, she looks up and there is a familiar face and it's Patrick O'Leary. What the hell are you doing? Getting you out of here. I'm release command, you're my mistress, so... What oh, shit it is you? I've given up hope. <laughs> I had to be discreet. It took time, but I'm here now. The husband is a very important man, a close friend of Premier Laval, who, as you know, is head of Melissa. Come, madame, the ladies' possessions, please. And if there's one thing French authorities, you know, respected, it was a man coming to get his mistress. <laughs> I understand that. Don't let me, don't let me get in the way of it. So O'Leary gets her out. <laughs> Here, O'Leary. Magic cards, money, jewellery. Had a premier to answer to if it wasn't. It was a bloody stupid risk you took. Worthy of the white mouse. Henri told me, your family's now. I should be impressed. Does he know? You were captured? No. Soldiers, go, go. Money. Yeah. Fuck. Henri's jewelry. It's bad luck. No. It's not luck. 
Every time one of us gets on a train, the Gestapo knows about it. Don't tell me it's a bloody coincidence. Has to be. It's not. You have a spy, someone close. I can feel it, O'Leary. Like shit on the liver. After leaving Henri, she thought she'd get over the Pyrenees very quickly, but she couldn't. You know, she kept being beaten back, and safe houses would be found to be dangerous houses, and she'd have to fall back. And at one point in her travels, she found herself within 100 yards of her house back in Marseille. Marseille. And what she desperately wanted to do was to go and, you know, see her husband and see Henri and say, I'm still alive and I'm still going strong. I was right. There was another spy. A Gestapo agent called Le Neveu. The bastard had betrayed us every which way. O'Leary was arrested and there was no telling how many other names had been dished up. I had to make a run for it, but not before I'd warned our people in Marseille. Henri had to be told. I just couldn't do it myself. She felt that it was too dangerous, both for her and for him, so she didn't. And so there was no contact passed between her and Henri after she left. Three months I'd waited for my chance. Three long months from leaving Henri to leaving France. And this old boy wasn't going to stop me now. I told him, sweetly, that I'd drag him by his cui if he didn't keep walking. By this point in those early 1940s, from the point of view of London, what you looked across the Channel and saw was you saw Europe occupied by the Germans just about everywhere. But you also saw these pinpricks of light, these little resistance movements that, that had been sprinkling up. And they knew a little bit about them, but they didn't know a lot of them. But, but Churchill's idea was to set up an organising body, which was subsequently became known as the Special Operations Executive. And what it was about was, in Churchill's words, set Europe ablaze. And he really meant it in terms of sabotage, the wrecking of railways, the wrecking of um, factories that were working for the German war effort, and make life completely intolerable for the Germans occupying France. She gets back to London, she hears about the Special Operations Executive, and, uh, you know, she goes to knock on their door. Knock, 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 who's there? Nancy Wake, come on in. And they train her up over many, many months, and she's, it's a serious, I mean, it's almost a forerunner of M MI6, MI5, one of those two. Um, it's almost a forerunner of James Bond. The training was done in Scotland really to test how fit they could become and how they stood up to the stress of just physical work, hard work. The trainers delighted in making us climb up things and clamber down again. There were a few other women, some of them French. There were day manoeuvres and night manoeuvres, and we were often muddy, dirty and tired. And that was just for fitness. Some of them cracked up very quickly because either in terms of physical terms or in terms of strength of character, they just didn't have it. So that was the first stage. And she came through that, as she came through all her training, very well. Then the next stage of training would be to be in a different place, in England, south of England, where they were trained in what was rather ominously called silent killing. And they were trained how to kill people by slitting the throats or um, stabbing them in certain parts of the, of the back so that the person died instantly. Armed combat, unarmed combat, weaponry, munitions, codes, Morse code, how to, uh, I remember she told me she was taught how to disable a tank. You could disable a tank with some honey because if you got the honey into the petrol supply, you could stop a tank. 
somehow or other, when she found herself an, an agent among many other agents, she was, if not the best in the business at it, she was very, very good at it. And she was, uh, you know, she had journalistic skills, she'd worked as a journalist, so she'd always been good at skullduggery, basically, and, and now she was being a professional skullduggerer or skullduggeress. Well, let me just read to you something from her report. She has a strong personality, is pleasant, jolly and sociable, but capable of being rather difficult if upset. Superficially, she is inclined to be crude, coarse and noisy, but this behaviour conceals a more serious nature. She knew that the reports were being written on all of them and she worked out with one of her companions how to break into the com commander's office and get her report. Attracted by adventure and excitement, and at times appears to lack a proper sense of seriousness and responsibility. She is, however, essentially loyal and reliable and has a marked sense of humour, persistent and determined. She has abundant energy. Report was very, very good. And she said, she said, you know, to the commander, oh, report was very good, wasn't it? How do you know? She said, well, I broke in and I've had a look at it. You know, so, you know, they're, they're impressed. Then we joined the parachute school. With electric torches, we'd guide planes to the drop zone in a field. So they train her up, but she realises there's a problem up ahead. She's going to have to jump from a plane, parachute, down into occupied France. And from a little girl onwards, she, she was trying to prove her fearlessness to her brothers and sisters. And at one point, she climbs onto the roof of her house and they say, don't jump, don't jump, don't jump, why not? Because if you jump, you'll break your leg. Uh, and she says, oh, I want to jump. You won't jump, you'll break your leg. Well, they were wrong and they were right <laughs> because they were wrong that she wouldn't jump. She did, but they were right. She did break a leg and that put in her uh, a fear ever after of heights. So what's the way around it? So as she gets in the plane and she's had a coffee and she's had a sandwiches and she's, you know, taking off and she says to the, the American uh, guy behind her, all right, but come the time, I, I'm not going to be able to do this. You're going to have to give me a shove. And so there she is, and the, it was actually a hole in the floor. And she's looking at it, she's looking and thinking, I don't know if I can do this, I don't know. I wonder, I wonder if he's going to push me. And then, <laughs> there she's at. And, and she's falling down. should send us such a beautiful flower. <laughs> Cut out the French bullshit and get me out of this! Madame André? Yes, who are you? Henri Tardiva. At your service! Well, you can start by taking your bloody hands off me. <sighs> Is the radio operator here yet? Dennis Rake, they call him Din Din. No, we have not seen you. All right, take me to Gaspar. He's the way to the Marquis here. Why, but you do not go to Gaspar. Gaspar comes to you when he is ready. It is his way. Oh, is it now? It's not always easy to accept, accept the um, persuasion of uh, foreigners who have suddenly been parachuted into you. And so they did need to use, the SOE people did need to use their... Uh, courtesy and uh, good manners in dealing with the French to persuade them to operate in the way that uh, was felt best to assist the Allied cause. Madame! No. This is one of Gaspar's men. Gaspar is here. Why the bloody hell didn't he tell me he was coming? So I finally get to meet the great man, huh? Well, if he thinks I'm hurrying, I can think again. She was this rumbling volcano of anger, sometimes erupting into you know, absolute incandescent rage. But what went with that was this bubbling sexuality and a, and a certain bawdiness that was always present uh, when she had to choose a code line for her radio communications with the resistance. Uh, she chose a really quite filthy limerick, and it was she stood right there in the moonlight fair, the moonlight through her ninety. There's something, something, the nipple of her tit. Oh, Jesus Christ Almighty! And that was absolutely typical Nancy. Nancy. Oh, not any. 
Lo vedio. Niente. Gaspar! You know why I'm here? Mm. To save us from the German invasion. Mm. You. You woman. I can get all the munitions you need. Oh. My parachute dropped from London. With no radio. Well, my operator will be here. Mm, this is uh, Den Den? Yes. Where is he? Well, I don't know, but he will be here. You are useless. We got this far without you. We finish it without you. It wasn't enough to say I'm Nancy Wake, I'm from the Special Operations Executive. She needed a radio and a radio operator because without that, you know, there's no capacity to call London and, and get, get it all to happen. It wasn't possible to deliver him the following night and so for a long time they were without a radio operator and therefore really powerless. Their task was to go and uh, link up with a particular resistance group that um, had been identified. Form them into a fighting body, radio us, we'll be able to drop them money, ammunition and guns. Well, they found the group all right, but they couldn't do anything about it because they had no radio communications. I've met some arrogant Frenchmen in my time, but Gaspard takes the biscuit. <laughs> he thinks he can... English. What can you expect? Did you hear that? <laughs> the bastards are talking about me. She has got a pile of honks in that handbag of hers. It's there to be taken. Ah, so you are offering her? I will do it. I will seduce her, kill her, and take the money. Not before I break his fucking neck. Ah, Marcel. You look upset. I am. Don't worry about Gaspar. He is not used to talking to a woman. Oh, but you are. I can see you have a lot to offer, and I'm ready to listen. But uh, perhaps we should go somewhere more private. How about my room? Why? Good. And would you like to take me to bed as well? I would be honoured, of course. Mm -hmm. And then kill me and steal my money. Is that the plan? No. Do me a favour, mate. Just fucking try it. Not myself! Forget her, she has nothing. Sorry I'm late, Ducky. Anyone need a radio? <laughs> mm. Missed you. Oh, looking good. Come and meet these bricks. Hello. Her radio operator, oddly enough, who was an avowedly gay man in 19, 1940s London. There wouldn't have been many of them. His name was Dennis Rack. Den Den, she called him. And she said, oh. Yes, he was a queer, and I knew he was a queer. And I was thinking, oh, st steady on, Nancy. You know, people don't really talk about that uh, these days, or don't really use that kind of language these days. And But she was so matter-of-fact and so straight up about it. She said, I knew he was a queer, but he was my friend and I loved him. Which, if you think about it, for the 1940s was a pretty progressive attitude. How soon can we arrange a drop? Is tonight good for you? Bloody brilliant. What are the chances of getting a message to La Résistance in Marseille? It's not in the handbook, lovey. No, I know, but... Mon ami, you are about to become the most well-armed marquee leader in all of France. And Gaspar? Who? <laughs> I meant to say, I like the look of this one, yours or mine? Mind on the job, Din Din. Don't believe me, sweetie, it always is. But she realised that, you know, as a woman, you know, the odds would initially be stacked against her and that they would be quite suspicious of, of, of having a woman uh, attempting to lead uh, this band of Maquis because war was seen as, as, as man's work. There were many who would, choose, would want to lead those 7,000 men. There was only one of them that could get on the blower and make planes come over and have machine guns come down. It wasn't just guns and explosives. We needed boots, greatcoats, bandages, and a few small luxuries, pour moi. Face creams, tea, and new stockings were always a treat. Suddenly, Gaspar gets very interested because this, this, this Madame André can make the sky rain with what I want it to rain with. Nancy was more than happy to get stuck in, and it was by demonstrating that that I think the Marquis sort of thought, hmm, got a slightly odd one here. 
at which point she would frequently bring out a bottle of whiskey and they'd start to drink. She'd start to drink with the local resistance leader and said, all right, let's start drinking. Last man left standing at dawn wins. I reckon it was the Kiwi part of it that made her a good drinker. I cannot describe to you the parachute roll on fucking concrete to Piccadilly Circus. She has the most marvellous calves. Really, they were in the air. Uh, oh, 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 now, if I was in I have seen some big drinkers in my time. I've been a big drinker in my time. I've never, ever come across anybody that could put it away like Nancy and never turn a hair. Stagger. <laughs> put a number on the She had a good time, I think. Um, I remember asking her about her time in London and, you know, was the agenda to get back to France as soon as possible to see what happened to Henri, and she says, well, no, no, that wasn't the motive. I said, so what was the motive? She said, to be parachuted in, one woman with 7,000 marquee, what would you do, Roger? How, what would you think? And gave me a bit of a wink. So I think she had a good time with the marquee. And again, I said to her once, I said, look, you know, you, you really liked Henri Tardivar. He's a rugby player. He's a Frenchman. It's a cold, lost and lonely night. Did you ever... With any, any of, and, she, and what she said, her exact words, she said, if I had accommodated one of them, I would have had to have accommodated all of them. So she said she had took no lovers in the forest. Move, move. Le Neveu. You know who he is? Ah, he betrayed O'Leary. And half of Marseille. I hate the bastard as much as you do. More. So why did you try to stop me? Let us give him a taste of his own medicine. Turn into Nazis, you mean? Think like they think. Do what they do. Is that what we're fighting for? Wait. No. It's time to put this prick out of his misery. <laughs> if you don't do it, I will. I think because it was such an intense time during the war where they had to watch each other's backs and they also had to trust one another as well because if anybody was an informer uh, or anybody was potentially um, going to rat to the Gestapo, you know, they couldn't afford for those kind of risks to, to endanger them. So it would have been a very, very tight band. By the spring of 1944, the whole purpose of SOE in France was turned towards preparation in various ways for the Allied invasion in June. D-Day was coming and the idea was the Special Operations Executive is to organise these resistance bodies and have them armed and with ammunition so that when the D-Day landing happens in Normandy, what's going to happen is German divisions from occupied parts of Europe all over are going to start to rush towards Normandy to stem the breach. Early on the 6th of June, the long-awaited invasion finally bloody appeared. Resistance fighters all over France were wound like springs, waiting. Then 300,000 troops landed between Toulon and Cannes. We all hoped this was the beginning of the end for the Germans. Nancy's coming into her own. This is now, you know, Thunderbirds are go. You've got the men, you've got the money, you've got the guns, you've got the ammunition. This is what you've got to do. So they, you know, they worked out where the divisions were coming from, the Germans. They'll be coming on this railway, they'll be crossing this embankment, you know, passing through this mountain pass. Hit, hit, hit. And so she leads these forces in these attacks on the Germans, trying to get to, to, to send the landing. We were flat out, buggering up everything we could. We blew up bridges, railway lines, roads, all day and all night. What did the Nazis do? They burned houses, hanged innocent people, shot them against walls when they couldn't get who they really wanted. Us, the Marquis. In the part of France that I was living in, I believe La Gaillard, the nearby town of Tulle, there had been the resistance had been active, and the Germans came through that town and said, "Okay, you want to, you want to, you want to take pot shots at us? Okay, get a hundred men." They got a hundred men and they hung them from a hundred lampposts. One 
hundred of them say, okay, anybody else want to take pot shots at us? That was what they were like, the Germans at that point. They were, they were, they were absolutely desperate. They were vicious. They were without mercy. In Orador sur Glane, German troops slaughtered almost 650 villagers. They set fire to the bodies and burned the town to the ground. The men were accused of ambushing German troops, and women and children died in the flames, locked up in the church. This was the terrible price paid for resistance. Still, we were getting more recruits by the day, so now Gaspard had 5,000 men camped on a mountain plateau, obviously a juicy target. But even with 15,000 German troops headed our way, he was still too pig-headed to listen to me. These men have come here to fight the Germans. They've got mobile artillery, a thousand armored vehicles, ten planes, and what have you got? Guts! We do not run like you Britons. No. We fight them to the death. You are outnumbered. You will never win. Your men will die. You go, you leave us. These are your escape routes. When you come to your senses, for God's sake, use them! for my own escape route. I knew I wouldn't be able to play the sexy housewife or flash a bit of tit to get through. Not this time. Not driving a car away from a full-on German assault. There were desperate firefights going on all around the plateau. London ordered Gaspar to withdraw, but I knew he wouldn't do it. So I played on his ego signed a top French general's name to the radio message. One look at that, the damn fool couldn't move quick enough. Bloody time, too. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I had to do it. We were utterly surrounded. I, I, I do just what? thought. <sighs> it was so desperate that at one point her radio operator thought they're about to take me. They're about. I've got to destroy the radio. I've got to destroy the codes. I've got to do it. So he destroys the whole thing. Just at the last, they have managed to get away. You know, we're alive. We're, you know, we're we're all we're all good. We're alive. And Den Den says, yes, we are alive, but we haven't got the radio. And without the radio, it's, it's, it's you know, Samson without his hair. It, it's, it's, it's John Wayne without a gun. There's nothing they can do. And so Nancy realises we need, we need a radio and we need a radio fast. It's an SOE radio at Chateau Roux. Well, that is a 400 kilometre round trip. No, 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 there are roadblocks everywhere. We never get through. I could, on a bicycle. With no backup, no identity papers. I can handle the checkpoints. I've done it before. Yeah, I don't... Look, what other choice do we have? With no radio, we have no contact with London, no intel, no weapons. We can't even organise the marquee. We're just a bunch of French ferals running around in the forest. It is true. Oh. Put on the mirror. I'm making that bike ride. Oh, Nancy, lovey, small problem. No bicycle. Well, you haven't heard the old French joke. What's the gypsy recipe for chicken soup? First, steal a chicken. She wouldn't plan it. She would give it a go and work it out as she went along. And, and that's how, in that big bike ride, she didn't think about how she was going to get through those checkpoints. She, she would do that when she got there. She would assess the situation quickly, charm or 
lie her way through. It wasn't some grand plan. I'd barely ever ridden a bike before, and by 40 k's in, I was knackered. One more turn. One more turn. My heart sank at every checkpoint, but I smiled and flirted with the guards when what I longed to do was blow their ugly mugs off. believe it. 200 kilometers in a day and a half on a bike just to be turned away over a password? This was not going to happen. He sent the message to London all right and I hoped to hell we'd get our new radio or we were screwed. And then it was on your bike, Nancy. That damn bike. I was past exhausted but it was 200 kilometers back to my men. So off I pedaled. One more turn, one more turn. When she'd been on the bike, it was so exhausting and she didn't dare stop. She actually wet herself while she was sitting you know, on the seat of the bike because she was so desperate to complete the journey. Nancy said to me that the bike ride was the proudest thing that she'd ever done and that she felt it was the bravest thing that she'd ever done. Oh, God, what have you done to yourself? There is a, a slight sense of awe being with somebody who has achieved so much in their lifetime, um, but also somebody for whom my generation owes a debt of gratitude, because if it wasn't for people like Nancy Wake saying, no, I'm not standing for this, and I'm going to stick my neck on the line, and I'm going to do my bit to try and defeat Nazi Germany. If it wasn't for people like her, then the war could have had a very different outcome. And what I most remember about that first meeting was she, she undid her shirt, and she showed me this scar, this bayonet scar. And from there to there, where a German soldier had slid her wide open. And it was just amazing, this little old lady telling me these stories and realising, gee, you know, she really must have been something in the day. Ah, ta-da! Airmail from London, Sheriff. All thanks to you. <laughs> oh, you never guess what else. Tardy's planning a hit and run. On what? The Gestapo headquarters at Mont Luzon, all the top brass. The little shit. It's my bloody idea. <laughs> Thought you might be interested. The raid was arranged for when those thugs were enjoying their pre-lunch drinks. Tarivar sent me through the back door. Did it bother me, killing those men in cold blood? Not for a second. I remembered the tortured Jews in Vienna, the pregnant French woman bayoneted in front of her screaming child. My friend in the resistance who'd had his head cut off with an axe. If you ask me, the only good Nazi is a dead one. At one point I said to her, look, because I'd, I'd done my research, why did you raid this particular Gestapo headquarters and not that one? And her exact answer to me, she said, what kind of a stupid question is that? You can get fucked! And I was just absolutely taken aback, just was shocked. And so I, I turned the tape recorder off and I said, Nancy, I honour you. And I respect you. And I don't, I don't ask you in return as your biographer to honour me, but 
you've got to give me sufficient respect that you don't talk to me like that. The only person who talks to me like that is my wife. And she said, I said, so are we clear? So if you talk to me like that again, you know, this project is finished. And she said, Rrr. and I said, but. Turn the tape recorder on, put it there. So why do, why do you, why did you raid those Gestapo headquarters? And she said, Rrr. you can get fucked. <laughs> and that was the beginning of my relationship with Nancy Wake. <laughs> She had a wonderful war. She had the time of her life. And when peace arrived in 1945, the party was suddenly all over. I really don't think that life was ever the same for Nancy after that, simply because the, all the fun was gone. She enjoyed the, the daring do. She en enjoyed the gun battles. And then suddenly, when there's no war to fight anymore, then you've kind of got to go back to ordinary life. Paris was won. But the South fought on until the liberation of Vichy. Suddenly, all the German troops were evacuated. Collaborators vanished into thin air. And the streets went wild with joy. Soldiers and Marquis alike, we were toasted wherever we went. part of the liberating trip. She was in one of the first trucks that got in there, chased the Germans out, and they haul up, you know, the, the, the tricolour, and they play La Marseillaise, and they're all in the square, and, you know, Vichy is free again, France is free. And she sees somebody that from, from the old days back in Marseille. It's so good to see you. And you, you look wonderful. <laughs> Are you going back to Marseille? I'm heading there this afternoon. Why? To see Henri, of course. Oh, no. I thought you knew. I don't know. You must know. You must have heard something. She was very troubled by this afterwards, that Henri may have been left in a difficult situation, and hoped, I think, that he had got away and was hiding somewhere, or at, at the very worst was in prison. Uh, she thought he was very brave to stay behind. She thought that was... Um, Pretty heroic. Andre Fioka. You came to see me, Henri, at home. Who did? The Gestapo. They told me they know who your wife is, that she is this. White mouse they are looking for. They told me I can take you to a hospital. All you have to do is confirm who Nancy is and tell them what she did. Where you think she could be? Nazis. Take them burn in hell. <laughs> She's not worth this. She's not worth my son's life. Never speak of this again. He was so generous, so kind. He always gave me everything I asked for. He was a lovely, lovely man. It was dawn on the 16th of October, 1943. When I woke up, I told myself over and over, it was just a dream. It was just a dream. Well, how could I have kept going? Given her activities, she felt that she was the one that should have faced the firing squad. If anybody was gonna take the hit on this, she was the one that needed the blindfold. As it turned out, they couldn't get her, so they got Henri. I don't think she would have forgiven herself for, for what happened to him. Uh, I think the sacrifice that she made uh, when she left France and went to go and fight with the SOE um, was potentially too great a sacrifice for her to bear. You... You murdered my son. Leave it. 
Madame? Do you know what happened to him? Son. Tell me. It started with a traitor you warned us about. The Nouveau. While O'Leary was rotting in jail, he came by information that he needed to pass on to the Marseille resistance. A prisoner he trusted was about to be released, so he gave him a message to Pastor Henri, using a code that he would recognize. The prisoner was a Gestapo agent. The Gestapo had arrested him, tortured him, and killed him, executed him. And, you know, Nancy, again, of the sorrows of her life, that's, that was the foremost sorrow of her life. Henri was the love of her life, his execution was the greatest sorrow of her life and she always felt guilty that the reason that he'd been executed, not unreasonably, was that he was, he was her husband. When I asked Nancy about Henri and how she coped with his, his death, she had a very far away look in her eye and she said to me, uh, I loved him, uh, Henri Fiocca was his name uh, and he was a wonderful man. And Interestingly, his photograph uh, was stuck to the wall next to her bed. No sign of her second husband, uh, but there's no doubt that Henri Fiocca was the love of her life. <laughs>